Okay, what is going on everyone? So this video is gonna be a response to my last video, which was my April Fools video, basically the Technique Tuesday episode hosted by Bro Jeff. And if you haven't seen the video, I'll have that linked down below. That's basically a four minute video of my alter ego giving the worst possible lifting advice that you can imagine as an April Fool's joke. Um, but we're gonna kind of respond to that in this video. But yeah, it's like four minutes. If you wanna watch it, I'll have it linked down below. And then there's like a minute of bloopers, but I think most of you guys have seen it. And we're gonna kind of go through the response to that. First things first, I will say that I've been surprised at the response to that video. I was actually pleasantly surprised at how positively it was received. So it's my my most liked video in a really long time and it got a 98% like to dislike ratio, which is super high for any video, but especially high for a video like this, which could very easily be taken out of context. So I was impressed with, I won't say I was impressed, I was actually pleased with how many people basically got the joke and thought it was funny. Basically what I expected was the people who are subscribers and regular viewers of my channel would basically catch on right away that this was Bro Jeff, Bro Jeff who was hosting this and it would just be basically a troll video. And anyone who was new to my channel because my videos reach both subscribers and non-subscribers would think that this guy's just a total idiot and would just totally write it off right away. Whereas what actually happened that I found a little bit surprising was a lot of people, including subscribers, were actually fooled by the video until I said that it was an April Fool's video. In retrospect, I can see how it would happen because I think I was still, or I should say Bro Jeff, was still speaking with a very professional, informative tone. And so I think a lot of people were just really confused and were kind of like, wait, this doesn't sound right, but you're speaking in a way that sounds very professional. So maybe there's something to it. And it just took until it got to a certain point of ridiculousness or until I just showed my hand and said I was trolling uh, that people actually finally realized what was going on. So the first thing I wanna talk about here is basically that in health, fitness, bodybuilding, whatever, it's very rarely the case that you'll find something that is undeniably true. So in all situations, all the time, this is the thing that is always gonna work. And by the same token, it's actually quite rare to find something that is always complete and utter nonsense and never has any value or application in any context. Usually most things fall in a gray area where they may have merit for some people in some circumstances and may not in others. And just to give you guys an example of this, I wanna look up an article here from Brett Contreras and Andrew Vygotsky from 2014. The term worthless should be used sparingly since almost everything has a purpose and provides some value depending on the situation. And they give the example of whole body vibration training, basically those machines that you just plop yourself down on and they vibrate your body and then that's supposed to burn calories or build muscle in some way. So you have people who don't actually wanna train stand on these things and think they're gonna get results from it. And so these machines have kind of become the laughing stock of most of the online evidence-based community. However, as they say in the article, whole body vibration training is promising for the promotion of tendon healing. So even something that has all of the makings of complete bro science can have application in specific circumstances, in this case, in the case of promoting tendon health. Okay, so I'm just pulling up the video here now and we're gonna go through these three pillars. By the way, I think that along, for regular viewers, I'm not gonna explain the joke, I think that'll ruin it, but I expected, like at the very beginning, the intro sequence is totally altered. We did a, a totally new uh, intro sequence that had the actual song down pitched and I think maybe the only guy or the only comment I noticed was the guy who actually produced the song, Ryan Little, who was like, as soon as I heard this terrible bastardization of your intro track, I knew that this was gonna be a troll. And then the Comic Sans font gave it away for a lot of people. Uh, the outfit, obviously, you know, if you're familiar with, the, with this character, you'll know that I use him as an example to demonstrate what improper lifting technique is in the Technique Tuesday videos. But if you haven't seen those videos, then you'd have no context for all those red flags. Uh, so I can see how that would be missed. Uh, but in any case, okay, let's dig right in with the first pillar. So the first pillar of proper training technique, according to Bro Jeff, is that weight always matters more than technique. One of the more cringy statements I've read in a while, but I think it's worth actually exploring a little bit. Now, I think that the main 
culprit here in terms of this having no legitimacy is the word always, like I kind of already alluded to. It's really the case that things are completely black and white in matters of health and fitness. So you could almost replace weight and technique with any other words, and this would still be almost a nonsensical statement because it's really the case that one variable always matters more than another variable. It's usually the case that it matters depending on the goal of the person or the advancement of the person or the context of their training situation or whatever. Let's just pull out for the sake of illustration, pull out weight and replace it with volume because we know that weight and volume are actually inextricably linked in a way. It's actually something that I feel like a lot of people would have to think about because we've heard for a long time now that volume may be the primary driver of hypertrophy. We at least know that increasing volume is all else equal, a pretty surefire way to drive muscular progress forward. And so maybe you could make the case that volume actually does matter more than technique. However, I would argue that technique is actually more fundamental because even though we tend to approximate volume as the number of sets times the number of reps times the amount of weight, technically speaking, volume is actually the amount of total work done. If you look at the actual physics formula for work, you'll see that it's actually force times distance. So there's a distance component to the amount of work that you're doing. And in exercise science circles, this distance component is basically captured by range of motion. So if you're not training through a full range of motion, are you really maximizing on the amount of volume that you're doing? If we go back to weight there, let's just assume that by weight, what bro Jeff means is progressive overload. And we know that progressive overload is the main thing driving progress forward. So maybe progressive overload does matter more than technique. And I do think that progressive overload is very important, but I don't think you should ever achieve it at the expense of training technique for a couple reasons. First of all, if you're progressively overloading, but you're technique is progressively breaking down, you may not actually be applying a progressive tension stimulus to the target muscle. You might just be getting other assistance muscles more involved through the momentum and the cheating that you're doing. So you might be progressively cheating, not progressively overloading. Your technique doesn't necessarily have to be perfect all the time, but it should be consistent if you wanna prioritize progressive overload. On the flip side of this, you have something equally absurd, which is basically becoming so obsessed with your training technique that it comes at the expense of you actually ever really training with any significant amount of effort. But when talking about this stuff in the context of people relatively new to the gym or just people who haven't established good lifting habits, I think that technique really is probably the most fundamental thing in, in most circumstances. And another thing that I got a lot was uh, a comment, something to the effect of, you do actually need to lift heavy though uh, to build maximum muscle. So even though weight may not be as important as technique past a certain point of form breakdown, you do still need to lift heavy if you wanna build maximum muscle. But we actually have quite a bit of research telling us how heavy you need to lift to build muscle. And it's actually not nearly as heavy as many people think. Uh, so there have been a bunch of studies done on this comparing hypertrophy between groups doing very high reps, groups doing very low reps, groups with very lightweight, groups with very heavy weight. And what we see is that you can see more or less equal hypertrophy across a very wide spectrum of rep ranges. So if you combine studies, you can see very similar growth between subjects doing 30% of their one rep max, you know, that's very lightweight, all the way up to 85% of your one rep max. So something you could do for like five reps. You could make the case that as long as you're training to failure or sufficiently close to failure, you can see very similar hypertrophy. However, with that said, last year in 2018, there was a new study published uh, and the Mass Research Review covered it here. And it actually shed some light on what that bottom end threshold might be for how light can you train and still make equal progress to what you'd make by training heavier. And the answer seems to be something between 20 to 30% of your one rep max. And I think that this makes sense. I'm very skeptical that you can get similar bicep growth by just training with the two pound pink dumbbells for sets of 50 or 100 reps as you would with you know, 30 or 35 pound dumbbells for sets of six to 12. And research now supports this. So it seems that you need to train with at least 30% of your one rep max to be capable of maximizing your hypertrophic potential. Uh, but that's actually still pretty light. But with that said, I think that there is still a practical 
hypertrophy rep zone, meaning that if I was to recommend to someone what rep zone to train in, I would say six to 12 reps, which means you're, for the most part, and it does depend on the muscle that you're training and the exercise, but for the most part, you should be training somewhere in the six to 12 rep range because that's gonna allow you to use sufficiently heavy weight to generate a significant tensile stimulus on the muscle without running the risk of becoming extremely taxed metabolically, which you run the risk of if you're doing very high reps. And you also don't run the same risk of injury as you would with very low reps. And another issue with very heavy weight is that it's really difficult to accumulate enough training volume because the reps are so low. So for practical purposes, I agree, you should actually lift quite heavy in a more moderate rep zone. But from a theoretical perspective, you can't really say that you need to lift heavy to build muscle. And I think that this is particularly salient in the case of people who have injury or just can't train heavy or hate training heavy. You actually can make significant progress with lighter weights, provided you're taking those sets to failure or very close to failure, which practically speaking is really hard to do. It's really hard to take a set of leg press, even harder to take a set of squats to failure if you're doing 20 to 30 reps. But still to say that you need to lift heavy or that lifting heavy is more important than technique, I think is actually nonsense. Okay, so pillar number two, according to Bro Jeff, is to emphasize the concentric only and ignore the negative. Now there were at least, I would say hundreds, if not thousands of people who commented that they got two or three minutes into the video before they realized this was a troll which means they heard me or I, Bro Jeff say this and <laughs> recommend that your spotter lift the weight off your chest so that you can just get the weight up and then drop it on the way down uh, and fell for it. So I won't say that that's concerning, but I think it does open my eyes to the fact that maybe making this video is necessary. So this is as close to utter nonsense as I could come up with uh, for, the, the April Fool's video because we know, and you know, I've said this on the channel a lot, that it's really important that you control the negative for basically two reasons. The first is safety. If you're just letting the weight fall, you're so much more likely to snap your stuff up. But even if you don't really care about safety too much like uh, Bro Jeff over here, I still think you want to take the eccentric or lowering phase very seriously because it probably is the more anabolic contraction. That isn't fully fleshed out in the literature, but I think you can make that case. You're at least stronger on the eccentric than you would be on the concentric. So I think it'd be kind of foolish to just let the weight fall and not take advantage of that potential increase in tensile stimulus that you'd get from resisting on the negative. Uh, also, you provide more stretch to the muscle here in the, in the lengthened position. So there's various reasons why you might think that the eccentric is more important for building muscle. So you definitely don't want to just ignore it. One of the cues that I like to use in my own training is thinking about the negative as a sort of failed positive. That's just using the bicep curl as an example. You know, you would curl the bar up and then on the negative, you wouldn't just let the weight fall back down or, or even just think about lowering the weight. You'd actually think about actively resisting. So kind of pushing the weight up, but slowly allowing it to come back down. So you can think of it as if you were trying to get the weight back up, but it just so happens to fall back down. And that's gonna apply a lot of active tension on that negative phase. And you obviously don't wanna exaggerate that to the point that like the negative takes a long time. Generally speaking, you only want it to last one or two seconds, but still I think you should be actively resisting on the negative for the most part. That doesn't apply to every exercise. So for example, I recommend lowering much faster on a deadlift. I do think of that as one of the very few concentric only exercises. And on a squat, you don't really wanna think about the negative necessarily as a failed concentric, because you really wanna load up the stretch reflex in the bottom there. But when it comes to like pretty much every single joint exercise or exercises that are kind of trying to isolate one or two target muscles, I think it is smart to think about the negative this way. Okay, pillar number three was that range of motion doesn't matter. Uh, we kind of already talked about range of motion. Uh, I think it is really important, uh, but Still, by the same token, I don't think I'd put range of motion necessarily on a pedestal. And I think that there is a place in your training for partial ranges of motion. However, I think that all else equal and for the bulk of your training program, you should be training through a full range of motion that's comfortable for you. Uh, so what a full range of motion 
is for you is going to depend on your mobility, your skeleton, the particular exercise. So for example, on like a preacher bicep curl, I could see merit in, you know, doing a, a, say 10 reps with a full range of motion and then just pumping out the top end of the range of motion to kind of get a few more effective reps in at the end. In the video here, I think I used the bench press as an example after or I should say Bro Jeff used the bench press as an example after not wanting to use the squat. He suggested that you only bring the weight a quarter or a half the way down so that you can use more weight. That's something, except for like maybe in the case of a Spoto press, where, which is like an advanced exercise for powerlifters who try to train through that sticking point, I would never recommend cutting a bench press range of motion short just so you can use more weight. That is explicit cheating on the exercise and if you do that in the gym your bench press doesn't count you need to bring the weight all the way down to your chest that's how it's done in competition and that's what an actual bench press looks like uh, so th this might be the one i don't know i disagree with all of bro jeff's pillars quite strongly but this one in particular bothers me because it's really common to see people restrict their range of motion just so they can use more weight. And like I said, except for in those advanced cases, that's something I would almost never recommend. Now, the very last part of this video was the motivational pep talk about hyping yourself up and all of that. That was kind of me just playing along with the fact that like, it's kind of ironic that the people who hype up the most then go and just use like a partial range of motion or have their spotter lift the weight off them. Uh, it wasn't to say that hyping yourself up is bro science. There's actually a lot of interesting research on using music, using positive affirmations, even like ammonia salts and stuff like that in the case of power lifters, even though the evidence on that is actually kind of weak. But still, I think that some kind of preset ritual actually has quite a lot of merit, and I might go into that in another video. The whole hype up thing really does depend on the person. Some people do better with a lot of hype, some people do better without much hype, but I think, you know, well, it goes without saying that hyping yourself up that much before like a set of really bad form bicep curls is probably not the best way to earn your respect in the gym, if nothing else. So anyways, guys, that is my full response to bro Jeff. Uh, hopefully you'll take my word for it and not his. Uh, but yeah, he's going to continue to make appearances and demonstrate improper lifting technique and the remaining Technique Tuesday videos. So you guys can have a look out for that. Thank you guys for hearing me out. I know this was a bit of a longer video, but I did want to do that full response. Don't forget to leave the video a thumbs up if you enjoyed the video. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And I'll see you guys all here in the next video.